was thinking about this sermon for several weeks. Uh, just some thoughts came to me talking with a, a couple men in the church and, and dealing with some people in life. And I, I made a comment, which I've made many times to people. I said, you know, I think when we get to heaven, we're going to be really uh, thrilled to find people there we didn't know they could make it. Hello? And there's several problems with this while we're down here. is Our judgment calls and our lack of understanding of grace and, and then just, you know, the way people are. I mean, it's hard to sort through things with li- in life many times with people. And I want to preach a sermon tonight I call Hard Cases, comma, No Problem with the Lord. Now, uh, we need some patience sometimes working with people. Can you say Amen. God's had patience working with us. Can you say amen? amen? He has, and he's a good God. So here in the book of Luke, this is uh, some of the last moments Jesus is breathing upon the earth at his crucifixion. He's hanging on the cross, and uh, here's where we're going to pick up the story in verse 32. There were also two other criminals led with him to be put to death, Luke 23, verse 32. Verse 33 says, when they came to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left hand. uh, And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know uh, what they do. They divided his garments, they cast lots for those garments. The people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Christ, the chosen of God. So the soldiers mocked him also, uh, coming, uh, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription also was written over him in the letters of the Greek, Latin, and the Hebrew, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him and said, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us also. But the other answering rebuked him and said, do not, do you not even Fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you would be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. In the the companion scripture, Mark's account, Mark 15, 39, when the centurion who stood opposite of him, saw this. He cried out like this and breathed his last. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. And that's really what the centurion was recognizing there. This is not just a guy dying on the cross. He got the revelation. Verse 48 says, And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breast and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. And Nicodemus, or rather, uh, verse 50 says, but now there, w- behold, now behold, there was a man named uh, Joseph, a council member, of, a good man, and a just man. He had not consented to their decision. Indeed, he was from Ar- Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who he himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, John also throws in, there's another guy there named Nicodemus. John tells us in chapter 19, verse 39, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds for embalming Jesus. And they took the body and buried it in strips of linen and with the spices and the customs of the Jews to bury and he did this with, uh, uh, Nicodemus did this with Joseph of Arimathea. So here we have a cast of characters there at the cross with Jesus. And uh, we have, number one, we have a guy, two guys hanging on crosses with him who are criminals. And more, most likely 
they're Jews. They're men that knew right from wrong. But they're being judged and they're being crucified. They're dying. That's the death penalty. They're dying on the cross. And there they were being judged, being crucified, one on one side of Jesus, the other on the other. And uh, the one begins to mock Jesus and say, look, you know, you can get so you're the son of God. Get us out of here if you are who you say you are. And the mockery begins. But the other one has a revelation. He says, you know what? Uh, you, you know, buddy, shut up. You don't, don't you fear God? You and me are getting what we deserve. That's really interesting. I have read some things and listened to some last statements, you know, people made, you know, but before they're being put to death uh, because, for different reasons. I've done that because of a study like this. But this guy's saying here, he's saying, you know what? I deserve what I'm getting. And he knows what he's getting. He's not coming off the cross till he's dead. And he's certain of it. And he has a revelation there, and he says, Lord, remember me. You know, and Jesus says, you'll be with me in paradise. No doubt, the guy knew he was doing things in life. He's a criminal. He knew things were going to get him in trouble, and uh, he's getting his just desserts, so to speak. And, uh, you know, it, it's difficult for Christian people, I've heard it's difficult for people who don't understand grace. I've read about accounts of people who got saved in prison who were nasty people deserving of death, and they were getting it, and on death row they get saved and they have a conversion, and I've read where people have mocked that, you know, and uh, I hope they got saved personally, you know, and I believe God is able to save anybody. But see, mankind has a problem with this. They don't understand how good God is. I'm not saying we have a license to do whatever we want and we'll go to heaven. That's not at all what this sermon is about. But what I'm saying is too often we see the hard in people and we, can't, we lose sight of the grace of God. We see how difficult people can be, stubborn, evil, sinners. So we want to examine this textual setting, you know, what we have here. And so, so often men confuse the issues because they don't know the grace of God. Here are Jews there also who go by the law. Here's Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They're very much men of the law. They're religious as can be. They're both extremely religious men, but they're good men. And how many of you know the law wouldn't save you? They needed Christ. And you look at this setting, you glimpse into those present, you know, it's hard to determine who would be the candidates for grace. But here's the thief next to Jesus, knowing he's going to get what he deserves, and yet Jesus says, today, you'll be with me. Here's Joseph of Arimathea. Here's Nicodemus, this guy. If we read about him early on in Jesus' ministry, and the guy doesn't have the guts to stand up for Jesus. I, I think a lot of Christians would write people like that off. We need to be careful how we judge. Amen. I, sometimes uh, we can be critical people. I mean, some people can be critical people, not us. I'm preaching about all them, you know. But we need to be careful, folks. Ah, they're just religious. I remember one of our pastors and uh, one of our missionaries going through a, an issue and uh, lots of issues, multiple issues. Missionaries go through a lot of things we don't go through, folks. And, what, you know, he concludes, and it was hilarious. He wrote down a list of things to explain to me why they can't have revival, and maybe they just need to come home and find direction, et cetera. And so when he comes to this conclusion, he makes the phone call. He's got it all ready, and he starts going down the list. And I said, uh, finally, at one point, I said, well, it sounds like they're all just really religious. He goes, yes, yes, yes. I said, Man, they're so different than us, all those people in that nation. They're all religious. And he knew exactly. He knows me, and I know him, and he would love, he'd, he'd laugh at this story because it's so true. And he just said, you know, man, you got me. They're religious. And I said, well, what, what, what about you, brother, when you came into church? If I remember, and he says, yep, yep, he was religious to the bone. But he's saved now. Got saved back then, too. And he had a totally different outlook, and they have great revival today in that church in Brazil. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, Sean, amen. 
He had a breakthrough. He said, and he told me about it, that conversation. He said, man, it just changed his whole perspective. He really, remember he was preaching here and he's telling us he found the new thing. They're so religious. He just said, that's fine. Great. Hey, hallelujah. Come to church anyway. They come and they get saved. And they can make converts. We get frustrated with people. We get frustrated with their religiosity. We got also a guy at this cross here. There's a man standing there. He is a Roman centurion. He is an accomplished soldier. Listen, if you are, uh, you know, you reach those ranks in that army of Rome in those days, you're somebody. You are set for a pension for life, but up until that time, you know how soldiers always made their money? They made their money taking what they wanted. That's, how, that's why they came to John the Baptist and asked, what do we do for a soldier, man? We're under conviction. We want to get saved. He says, take no more than your wages. Because, you know, have you not read even in your Bible what they did? They take the spoils. It's part of your pay, man. Get what you can get. Take what you can take. They, they run roughshod over at people's and their uh, properties. And so here's a soldier there. He's come up through the ranks, however he did, but he is now a man with uh, some kind of heathenistic dignity, you know, for where he has uh, arrived in society. And he's standing there at the cross. You know, maybe he would, no one ever, ever thought this guy would give God a second thought. But in this moment, this guy says, oh, my, look what we've done. That's the Son of God. Got a revelation. We would perhaps not consider uh, these guys all people that would be most likely to be converted, like like us. How many of us would have in our early life would have been voted most likely to be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, living a Christian life? I don't know, not me. But Jesus had a different plan. See, our God is, and his gospel is a gospel of second chance. And there are many testimonies of the most lost and unlikely people in life that, you know, I, the older I get, the more I see this. People that were hard cases and fought against, you know, uh, people's testimonies. After you save 10, 20, 30, 40 years or more, you know, you've been around a while and you've been dealing with some people a long time. I think of my own father. God bless him. I looked to see him one day. I think he arrived in heaven when he died. But he sure took a hard road getting there. And 80 some years struggling, fighting, obstinance against God, hardness. But you know what? In the latter days of his life, the grace of God engulfed him. And there are people in the family that thought, nah, he's, you know, he doesn't talk right anymore. He's lost his ability. To, you know, he, he doesn't believe. I said, well, you know what? I know what he's, what he's done. I've prayed with him. I've seen him with the tears of repentance and the calling out on God. And, you know, when I was in Israel a number of years ago, that's when he passed. And uh, he was frail. And we got the word. And my wife and I, she talked to me on the phone said, you know, I don't know if you should come home. I don't think, they don't think he's going to be around for 24 more hours and I said, oh, well, I said, here's what you do. I said, uh, call the air, just throw stuff in a day bag, call the airlines, and get on the next flight out of Jacksonville. Out of, she found one in Wilmington and made Pastor Smith drive her down there 95 miles an hour. Amen. She had two hours, I think, from the time we talked on the phone to be on the plane. She found a flight, got into Phoenix, got in that same evening in Phoenix late and uh, went to his bedside and was told he's unresponsive, he's done, he does, he's just done, he's just breathing his last breath, he doesn't recognize him, blah, blah, blah. She went in, I told her, I said, go in there and say, hi, Stan, it's Dave and Vanita. She said, I went in and said, hi, Stan, it's Dave and Vanita. And he looked over, he smiled, he goes, oh, hi. Well, everyone said he was done, he's finished, he's never, but you know what, there was a connection, and it's in Christ. And I knew he was at peace and ready to go. And, she, and you know, that was proof to us. I want to tell you. You know, and there were people that knew him all his life and would never have dreamed of him. We just had a, another friend who uh, just recently, a hard case, a family member, one of our church folks, Brother Marty, you know, and Dealing with his brother, hard, 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 and over the years, and soften up hard. So he said, man, the last three days of his life, pastor, this man asked for God's grace, and he's, you know, if you know, 
this brother Joe, he, he did have a foul mouth, like me, like all of us, before we were saved. But you know what Jeff told me? He says, Pastor, he said, last three days, he's, he'd talk, he, not a cuss word, not one. Change. Change. Grace comes down. You know, my brother, I had a brother early on in my salvation. I didn't know how to deal with stuff like the people that were hard, hard or nasty, you know. And here's a guy, I would go visit him. He lived in Phoenix. I lived up in the mountains. I'd go all the way to Phoenix to go hunt him down and just talk to him and see him. And literally, one time I went all the way down. It was just a long journey for us back then. And we'd go, and I, we, I'm at his house, and he's, he's telling me he's got something planned for us that night. Well, I'd only been saved a few months. And I told him I had things planned for us, too. We were going to actually stay here with our wives and make some hamburgers or something. You know, he says, no, 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 I got something planned, man. Just, you know, let me get changed, and he's, hey, we're going to go. He's got a party and things going on. I said, no, no, no. You know, and, I, 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 and he walked right away from me while I'm trying to talk to him in his house. Gone. You know, and that was just once. That happened numerous times. Years, several years go by. He's hard as can be against the gospel, adamant against it. I want to preach to him. I try to. I, I can't. One day I hear that he's in pace and he's up in the town I live in. He's showed up. He's come and he gets word to me through somebody else. Hey, tell Tell David that his brother's in town. If he wants to see me, he can come by such and such. It's a party house. He can go over there. He knows where that is and catch me at his lunchtime tomorrow. So I thought, well, son of a gun. That just made me madder than ever at him. So the guy wouldn't even come tell me. He's got a password along, and I can see him. There. And my wife, thank God, she has a good level head. She goes, you need to go see him. I said, well, yeah, I'm going to go see him. I'll go see him. <laughs> tell him exactly what I think about this. But I, no, he needs to get saved. You know what? I went over there. She came by and got me at work that day and drove me at lunchtime. I told my boss to be gone a little long. Went to that place. They said, oh, no, he split. <laughs> Gosh, man. He, you know, he was back to Colorado. Man, I was so ticked off. My wife remembers this story, I'm sure. I said, man, you know, there's some, this family of mine, they are so hard. They're so nasty. They reject God. They blah, blah. And you know what? I went about my work day and He's supposed to be gone, left for Colorado, but you know what? He couldn't get a ride, and he walked out to the north end of Pace in the town I lived in with his finger out, his thumb out, you know, backpack on, all this stuff, heading up north, and uh, my last job of the day, I had to deliver some material for one of our jobs out the north end of town, and I'm driving down the road, and I look, it was my brother on the side of the road hitchhiking. I said, man. Sorry, God, about everything I said, but I, I love this guy. I love you. And turned my truck around, came back. He thought he was getting a ride. He didn't recognize the worker. He comes running up. He sees me. It's like he saw a ghost. And I walked up to him, hugged him, said, man, so good to see you, you know. And, boy, I missed you today, you know. <laughs> you know? Yeah, he tried to sneak out the other end of town. And, I, man, I says, you know, he never would listen to me. He literally walk away whenever I start talking about Jesus. Walk, I'm telling you, I went all the way down to Phoenix from the mountains to visit him and witness to him. I'm in the middle of witnessing him. He walks outside. I walk outside. He gets his car, closes the door, and leaves. I'm standing there. Not even. So now I got him. I said, you know what? It's green chili season. My wife is, we've got some roasted. We're going to be eating Something tonight, I don't know what service he's making. I said, why don't you come by, have a nice meal. I just got to drop this material off. And I turned around because I live right around the corner from there. I took him to the house. My wife had the house smelled like heaven, man. Green chili cooking and good food in there, some venison and stuff. And he's, you know, my, I have a house. I'm not a dysfunctional unit anymore like the rest of us. I, I got a wood stove going on a cool, you know, wet fall day. House smells good, little kids running around, a wife that's home taking care of things. And I left him there. And I said, I'll be back in 30 minutes, an hour. Went and took that material out, come back. And uh, he says, I got to leave. I got to leave. I came back. He's going nuts. I said, well, uh, I'll, I couldn't talk him into staying, so I put him in the truck. I drove him back to the, where I found him. 
And I realized he wasn't going to listen to anything, so I had him in the truck. I took the long way, you know, got him back to where he was going. And the whole time, all I did was tell him, God loves you so much, you just, you will not know till you just ask him. And I said, I kept it so simple. I said, all he wants is your heart. He's, he knows all about you, your past. He knows us. He knows what we've done. He knows who. He just wants to help you. He wants to save you. All you got to do, I know you believe he died for you. you we're Catholic background, you know, Jesus on the cross. You just got to ask. He wouldn't answer. He'd just look out the window when I'm driving. I said, you can pray right now. It takes one minute, not even a minute, to ask, right? I said, you can pray when I drop you off. I said, you can pray while you're waiting for a ride. You can pray in a heartbeat. You can ask. It takes just a split second. All you got to do is, I'm telling you, I'm just pouring my soul out, but I'm, I'm just emphasizing, you know, you can do this anywhere, anytime. Just ask. God's so good. And I left him on the side of the road, wouldn't talk. I went home, got a call just a few days later. He was dead. And I thought, my goodness, man. I mean, I was shook to my core. I couldn't even speak. And all I could think about is God gave me that opportunity to tell him it takes that long to get saved. I wonder, I don't know if I'm going to see him in heaven. I hope so. I hope he had time to make his peace with God. But I want to tell you, God looks on people different than we do. He makes, he's, he gives second chances, third, fourth, fifths. He's good. Like we cannot even understand he's good. We write people off. We don't understand. But I'll tell you, even when I got saved, I... I think I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, but it bears repeating. You know, I, I, uh, I, I went and rejected the gospel. Boy, did I reject the gospel. I was just like my brothers. Rejection, rejection in your face. I, Debbie Stevenson told us after we got saved, we're all friends, her and Pastor Stevenson and us, Benita and I, and I remember Debbie telling us one time, uh, she stood up and actually did it. She showed me how Dave used to paste, you know, in his living room when he come home. I said, this guy's crazy. You talk about me go back and forth by the coffee table. This guy's driving me nuts. I can't stand there. I can't, I, you know, I'm going to tell Henry, we've got to work on different jobs. This guy's a nut. It's because I was anti-Christ. But God had grace. The night I got saved, I realized, man, I, I, I do not deserve this. I don't. I, if, I, if I get what I deserve, I'm going to wake up in hell. But I said to God, if you could do something, with me, you know what? There was grace. I'm not saying Dave Stevenson wrote me off, but something happened to me. I got a revelation of grace. God accepted me. This is why he gives more grace, because I realized, you know, I don't deserve this, and there's no way I can earn it. I'm, I don't know what I could do. James 4, verse 6 says, He gives more, but He gives more grace. Wherefore, He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Now, listen to this. He just speaks about the giving of this grace. He says, God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. So submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God. And he'll draw close to you, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, James is a very interesting read in the Bible. I love to read the writings of the Apostle James. He is so straightforward. And here he's talking about this marvel of grace. How wonderful it is. And then it's almost the same sentence. It's just... They're, they three sentences connect there. He's talking about this revelation of grace. And he says, you know, he resists the pride. Immediately when he talks about grace, he gives you the revelation, the understanding. Pride will hinder grace. You can't get it. Somewhere you've got to drop the pride. Humble yourself and he'll add more grace. In this submission to God, 
to God, you find that there's strength in grace for the insurmountable task of saving your soul or anyone's soul. And then James says, you sinners. <laughs> Cleanse your hearts, you sinners. Well, you know, that's, that's how people in the religious world look at sinners, you sinners. Got a, I had an incident years and years and years, decades ago. Somebody came to me, a young lady in church, says, you know what, pastor, you got to talk to my husband. Straighten him out. I, we, I thought, oh, oh, boy, marital problems again, you know. And, and she, I said, what, what's the problem? He goes, he, pastor, he wants to have some sinners to our house for dinner. I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I'm not stretching anything. She was like, she had, you know, one of these things, hands on him. He wants to have some sinners. There. I said, what sinners? She said, some guys he works with. I says, and so... Well, if you can't do it, why don't you send them to my house? I'll feed them. You know, I was trying to make a point, and then I was gracious, and I called him up, and we talked, and I said, look, yeah, you want to have, yeah. Well, she said, but they're sinners, sinners, Daddy. Sinners get behind me. <laughs> Jesus died for sinners. He is great. James says, you sinners. You know, and I, we think, religious people think, I mean, him, that's what James meant, you sinners. He said, there's grace for you sinners. Cleanse your heart, your mind. Get yourself right with God. And you double-minded. <laughs> it sounds like the kind of folks religion doesn't make any room for. Huh, they're up and down. One day they want to live for God. One day they don't. I don't you know, I'm waste my time on them. I... Well, I don't know how much time we're wasting when we're showing God's grace. What I mean is I don't think we're really wasting time. Show God's grace. James says, you know what? This is incredible. He gives more grace. So cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Double-minded, yeah, yeah, I was messing. I was trying to help that person. They're a double-minded jerk. And that's a capital J, you know. This kid, wicked sinners are... Well, God gives grace to those kind of people. Thank God this is how the Lord works, not like humans. Because he healed my hopeless and bitter heart, man. I was a young man, but, you know, a lot of young people have plans and hopes and, uh, uh, you, know, you know, a diary and things they want. Man, I had a list is all I had. People I was angry at and bitter at, and in my mind I had it going on. I was an evil, wicked minded person. Bitter, broken. But He gives more grace. Without this grace, there is no hope. He takes the deep hopelessness that's created by our sin and our religion and our double mindedness and everything else. And he redoes the heart. Without the grace, the heart gets embittered. Listen to Hebrews 12, 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold out his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing... He was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Looking carefully, the writer says, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. You know, and what would cause that grace to not register? Bitterness and the roots of bitterness. People let stuff smolder in there. You know, and that's why, thank God, you know, some... Bitter and cold and double-minded. Somehow, I think God reaches them just out of grace at some point in life. But you know what? There's a, there's a religious element in life, people in the Christian world, who mess things up and harden their hearts. I look at Esau. You know, Esau, was he had something to do with losing the blessing of destiny, like a whole lot. A lot of times people get bitter in life after they mess something up and they don't realize there's a dimension of grace that's awaiting them. 
I mean, it breaks my heart when I'm dealing with young people. Now, sometimes now that I'm getting older, I'm dealing with people that aren't so young, but they were once real Christians, but now they don't know how to come back to God. They don't know how. And now they're just bitter now, ticked off about things. And not only that, they, they, hey, they, they can tell you exactly where everything went wrong 16, 25, 32 years ago. And they go right back to that spot. Esau, and here's the reminder here. You know, when the writer is writing about Esau lacking and not coming under grace, can't grip, grasp it, he has a root of bitterness. And this, he relates it back to when he sold out. When he made his initial blunder in his destiny, he still goes back to that. I want to tell you, if you're watching live stream and you struggle with your walk with God because you know, I'm just hanging in and this, that, and that, or if you're here tonight and this, you know, these things happen, my destiny, I don't know, and I'm not going to go to church. Man, I'll tell you what, there's grace for you. There's grace. There's recovery. Esau had a lot to do with the fact he lost his inheritance. Backsliders often take themselves out of the picture because uh, as a cause for their misery. They want to blame someone else. Sometimes when you're on an outreach, it's the former believer who's the most enraged against what you're trying to do, you know, because they're backslidden and they're angry at others and at the church and People in, you know, wherever they're from, it's just amazing. I've met people, I know people, they'll speak of that infraction from when they were a child, you know. And this happened at a church, or I was misunderstood, or I backslid, and someone said something nasty to me, and I'll never come back. You know, man, there's still grace. You just don't understand that. I look at the text we had tonight, and I think, you know, they could have just took Jesus. You know, they, they could have just took him, beat him to death down in the bottom of the prison or something. They could have took him, just cut his throat. They could have done a number of things. But it, it's detailed on the cross. Sinners, religious people, heathen soldiers. And God bringing revelation to all manner of these people, that's the grace of God. Doesn't matter what your background is, doesn't matter what's gone wrong in your life, what you've done wrong, it's time to find the grace of God. And there is grace. And if God can save those impossible people, understand this, his hand is not shortened, Isaiah 59, 1 says. My hand is not shortened that I cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you between your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he won't hear. I want to tell you, if we throw out our excuses, there's a God that hears. There's a God that's always reaching out. I told a little story about the brother of mine who rejected so hard, and even tried to slip out of town. And this was hard for me to find him. I had no idea where he's living up in Colorado. He was in the middle of his own life. I had no, no, we didn't have phones back then, land phones or anything. Us folks, you know. And I find him on the side of the road with his thumb out, and I thought to myself how God extended those moments of grace. I felt some urgency. I had no idea what that was about. I'm a relatively young convert. But I'm just, I, I want, I know the way I think and what I'd like to tell him. <laughs> I said, man, I just need to tell him how easy it is to come to Christ and find grace. See, God sees everything so different than we do. And he knows your way home. Amen. Let's bow our heads tonight. Let's pray. He gives more grace, the scripture says. He's got lots of grace, plenty. Wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whatever. So, well, it's hard for me because so-and-so and somebody and that happened and this happened. Uh, no, it's hard for you because you don't know grace. 
Grace can cover a multitude of sins. Find your own forgiveness. Forgive those. Don't, don't waste a lifetime of bitterness and ups and downs and double-mindedness and having to be hounded into the kingdom. Man, don't, don't do that with your life. Let the grace of God change every dynamic within your life tonight. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You're at home. I, I'm encouraging you to pray with us tonight. Humble your heart. But he gives more grace. So humble yourself before God. Been double-minded? He still gives you grace. Get, get it. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He gives you grace. Got our heads bowed, our eyes closed for a minute. You need the grace of God. You want to change who you are, what you become, what's going on in life. You need the forgiveness and grace of God. I want you to lift a hand. Hold it right up towards heaven and say, this is me, and I do want to find that grace and get my life right with God. Hold a hand up towards heaven and say, this is what I need. If you're at home, God's speaking into your heart. You respond to God's grace tonight. Hold your hand up and lift it up. Say, God, here I am. Ask for that mercy. Oh, I think when I got saved, I just remember, just God, help me. I can't do anything without you. I can't find forgiveness. I can't change who I am, what I've become. I need you, whatever you can do. I want that. If you'll surrender to God, you'll meet him. He has the grace you need. Heads are bowed, eyes closed. God needs to touch your life. Turn your back slidden. Say, yeah, but you know, all this stuff that's happened in my life, I don't know. Esau became bitterer and bitterer and bitterer until he couldn't find that grace. You're listening to the word of God tonight. You're at home or you're here with us. You're hearing it. You, God's reaching out. Backslider, lift a hand towards heaven and say, God, touch me. Touch me. I surrender. You'll find grace. It's wonderful. You'll find love and forgiveness. Nothing like it. Christian, we must understand, he does give more grace. We need to be a people that just allow God to make those decisions in people's lives. We need to be redemptive. Keep reaching, reaching, reaching out, preaching, loving, praying, helping. Wait on the Lord with folks. I'm telling you, I think heaven's going to be a glorious surprise in many ways. When we get there, if we make it faithful to God, we'll make it, we'll make it. And when we get there, I believe it's going to be a glorious encounter, seeing all that God has done in his wonder of grace. Let's stand to our feet tonight. I want to open the altar and allow time to pray. You want to come, find a place, get a hold of God. The altar's open. You come and pray.